Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it was quite an interesting talk from Michael, so very difficult to follow on from that. I think a lot of what he covered is what I was thinking of covering as well. So it's not too bad. I think it's, it kind of shows where we are converging to as, uh, as a reflection on where we are uh, in BIM domain. And uh, what I'll do is my uh, presentation is mostly focused on the educational perspective because I'm in the academics and this is more of a ref reflection on what I've seen over the last few years and where things are going. So it's more of uh, questions that I pose of what, how we should approach it and where we should head. And just to give a bit of background, so I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Structural Engineering, uh, and we do collaborate with uh, departments uh, outside our uh, department as well. So I'll kind of cover that briefly. But you know, before I go into uh, uh, that, I'll just give a brief idea of my own background, because that kind, kind of gives you an idea of uh, my own perspective and my own reflection of how I'm coming from. So I spent a few years in Australia before moving to Finland. So I've been in Finland for the last uh, three years. And I came specifically for the BIM initiative. And uh, before that, I was in Australia also involved in the National BIM Guidelines Development and other projects, which was with the uh, Cooperative Research Center for Construction Innovation. And a lot of uh, the ideas that we are now developing within the BIM initiative of how to go about uh, upskilling people or how, how do we plan our research ahead uh, is a reflection on uh, what we have seen in Australia as well. So this is, uh, in very brief, uh, uh, the Alto BIM Initiative. So the Alto BIM Initiative is a multidisciplinary research group. Uh, we have uh, three BIM professors. So I'm in the Department of uh, Civil and Structural Engineering. We have one professor in the Department of Computer Science. And we have another professor in the Department of Industrial Engineering and Management. Uh, this group was formed in uh, 2012. So we are a fairly new group in, as a research group in uh, Alto University. And Alto University by itself is fairly new. Uh, even, even though the history goes uh, really back. The same applies to our research group as well. Uh, so uh, Finland has a very strong tradition in BIM, uh, more than 20 years roughly. And uh, we have done some great work there. But uh, the, the education sector in particular did not have any specific focus towards developing BIM programs. So there were researchers involved in doing things. There were many different groups split across Finland doing research and uh, doing some great work there. But uh, now, suddenly, around uh, 2010, the university decided that we needed to have some kind of a center of excellence, or at least aim towards a center of excellence around BIM. And that was when the Alto BIM Initiative was formed, with the idea that we don't have it sit in one department, rather have different departments starting from. So we invested a bit in terms of uh, the resources, people-wise. So as an initiative, uh, when, when we sat together, uh, three professors coming from different backgrounds, uh, not having worked, uh, many of them having worked together previously, we spent quite some time trying to understand what, how do we see BIM as, and how do we approach BIM to, in the education perspective. So the way we see BIM is basically, it's, 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 it's a medium which allows us to close the gaps in the construction uh, industry. And when I mean closing the gaps is if you think of a typical construction project, what you have is the design. So you have a gap between what you design and what you construct. There's a huge gap there, lots to be fixed. There's a gap between what you have constructed and what you maintain. You do not really maintain what you want to. And there's a gap between what you maintain and what you actually needed to do in the first place. And how do you kind of fill these gaps across the different phases? That's exactly what we are trying to aim for uh, when we think about uh, the research in terms of BIM. But that's not all, because uh, at the moment we have talked about BIM. I mean, of course, it's been covered earlier already. So there's a life management, uh, life cycle management perspective. And then, of course, uh, BIM is not just a tool. It's about a process as well. So there's a lot of interaction that goes in terms of the products, in terms of the processes, and in terms of people. So how do we understand that uh, interaction? And how do we plan for that? And of course, when Michael talked about uh, things ahead, level three BIM and so on. So we, what it means is there is a constantly evolving ecosystem. We do not know that ecosystem yet. And we, at the moment, uh, if you look at uh, the typical research going around, there isn't a lot of effort in trying to understand that very well. So people have picked up ideas, topics of interest that uh, works for them. And there's no concerted effort in trying to understand this, this ecosystem well enough. That's another area where we are trying to understand it, is how is the BIM ecosystem evolving, both at the macro level as well as the micro level. When I say macro level, it is about uh, the businesses, for example. So what's happening in terms of national policies? Where are we heading with it? Uh, how, does, how does the market react to it? So if 
if BIM was all good, everything was all so simple, and every, everybody was rational, we would have been using everything the way we wanted. It's been around for 20 years, but we haven't. So there must be a reason why we haven't done that. And that's also something that we need to understand so that we are better prepared for the ways ahead. So that's what we try to understand in these terms, and that will help us, even our agencies, to plan their policies and reflect the market requirements and so on. And the same affects the micro-ecosystem. When I say the micro-ecosystem, it's about the project level. So at project level, there are interactions between the products, between the processes and people. And these are also dependent on the macro-ecosystem. So these two interactions are equally important. And these are not very well understood. And now when we are in a domain where there's a lot of big data and other discussions going around, there is a possibility that we can collect all this data over a period of time and do smart analytics around these things. So this is something that we are very aware of. So this is just to give an idea of the kind of projects we are currently aiming for. So we are looking into the design side where, uh, the, of course, the first objective is to understand the use of BIM as a virtual design and construction tool. And then, of course, not just at that, but also look at how do we design better. So it's not just about using BIM, but also improving the efficiency in design process. The same applies uh, in the construction part. So it's not about uh, constructing as what we wanted, but also the construction process. How do we bring in things like lean construction, and how do we use BIM for that purpose? And then, of course, we have uh, uh, the smart built environment, which is where things are heading. And uh, the other important aspect that, uh, that is important, particularly in Europe and other places as well, that we have a lot of existing buildings now. So how do you use this infrastructure to improve the value of buildings which are already existing, rather than only developing for the buildings that you're going to create? So, uh, that's another important area that we are interested in in terms of the BIM research area. And then finally, uh, the BIM education so far has also not been, I mean, this in the last, I would say, in the last five years, there's been a lot of effort in trying to understand BIM education. But the investment in research in trying to understand that, as in what is the best way to go about it, is still uh, nominal. And it's also more of a uh, ad hoc thought, that you now you have developed tools, now you do things, and then you start thinking, how do we start educating people? And uh, it's equally important that it becomes equally central to the process because at the end of the day, as Michael was pointing out as well, it's, it's all about people. It's all about their skills and knowledge. So uh, I'll try to quickly wrap through these because uh, this, just to give an idea, and this kind of goes back to what has already been covered as well. So, uh, Finland is about 15, 20 years of BIM experience, so there are lots of different players. And this is only a partial view. I've not listed many of them, and this is just a quick snapshot of the players that we have. But they are, if you kind of uh, uh, organize them, then you have a set of people who need education. So this could be your contractors, your project managers, your, your designers, and so on. And that's a huge group there. So. And then you have uh, players in the education side who are supposed to be providing that education. So there, there you have universities, and then you have universities of applied sciences. And their roles are supposed to be different. And that needs to be understood as well. So universities are not meant to develop BIM modelers. BIM modelers and technicians should be coming from technical lab or applied sciences or uh, other institutes. And universities have a different role to play. And this needs to be understood as well. And then, of course, you have facilitators, people who benefit from the use of BIM or who, like, who would like to kind of promote BIM for other factors. So then you have organizations like owners and so on. And then the many different players. So this dynamic needs to be understood. And that's also part of understanding the ecosystem. So in this case, if you, if you may call it, this is about the BIM ecosystem. And this is, again, not very well understood yet. Right, so what I'll do is uh, I thought I'll take two cases. So I won't go too much into other aspects. And two different cases to explain what is happening in Finland at the moment. And this is just a snapshot of uh, the activities there. So the first case is more of what I would say is a collective effort where a set of different institutes have come together, supported by Building Smart Finland, and trying to understand what can we do for the current situation. And one of the areas where Finland has done quite well in recent years is the use of BIM, or at least the development of tools for infrastructure sector. And then suddenly you have these tools, you have these managers or top managers interested in promoting the use of BIM and with good tools, but then you do not have enough skilled people around. So this was the first, uh, okay, I'll come to that uh, separately, but then part of that is that, uh, so in 2013 with building Smart Finland and the universities around and the universities of applied sciences, we had this 
education group formed, and the steps were the following. They decided that what we needed was more publications, because we do not have enough good material about BIM education itself. And one of the ways to make it more accessible to people is have it as e-books, because then everyone could uh, have a direct access through the internet and so on. The second part was, as I said, uh, the focus was about uh, infra BIM in particular, but of course uh, it relates to other things, because uh, because we have been doing BIM in building sector for the last 15 years, we have fairly good uh, skills around, but uh, infra BIM was fairly new for us. And then about apprenticeship and training of high skilled people, and then about reskilling people. So there are always challenges of employment, and then uh, one of the ways that uh, uh, at least the leadership group decided was that uh, people, people who are looking for new employment or people who have lost their employment in other sectors could also be re-employed through the BIM route because there's a shortage of BIM skilled people. So that's another direction that streams are moving in. So this is a snapshot of uh, the infra BIM project. It was very, very practical as a, so what happened was in this case, uh, the, inf the companies that were in, in doing infrastructure projects, they were asked to nominate their own staff to be in involved in this project. And this was, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a 30 credit, credit course uh, spread over a good period of time. There were 60 students enrolled and uh, five university or five ed educational institutes uh, involving three universities and uh, two applied sciences universities delivered this project. So at the same time, uh, this was spread across different uh, cities as well. And uh, including, uh, so, so including the best practices, including uh, taking uh, students to construction sites and delivering uh, directly as a hands-on experience. And this has been received very well by the, and so I'm, I'm sure this is going to be revised uh, today. Right, so that was uh, the case one, which was about us kind of giving an idea of where the collective effort is going as a one example. The second part, but I thought that because this is where I'm involved more closely, so I can speak more with a little more authority here, is uh, the education plan that is happening at uh, Alto University. Uh, over the last uh, three years, that's uh, since I moved uh, in Finland, what we have been doing is we are planning uh, what are the courses that we really need at different levels. And uh, this is again a snapshot of the different courses. But one of the things which is clear in our plan, I won't go into the details of the courses. Uh, one of the things that is very clear to us is that uh, the current practice of uh, teaching BIM, which was also the case uh, in Finland so far, including at Alto, was somewhat misplaced because uh, BIM was typically part of the CAD courses. And that gives a very uh, wrong message to the students that it's a CAD tool. Uh, rather, uh, uh, rather what we have done for the courses that are ahead is instead of having courses which are specifically on BIM, we would rather integrate BIM into the existing courses. So if it's a course on advanced construction project management, you embed BIM within that. So if, if students do advanced construction management using BIM tools rather than having a separate course on BIM and then separately teaching what construction project management is because that gives a very wrong idea of what it is. Because as, as Michael was saying as well, it, BIM should typically cover all aspects of construction. And we have tools that cover all aspects of construction, but we do not teach it the right way. One of the other problems uh, probably might be coming in another slide, but I'll kind of uh, talk about it here itself, is uh, how we approach, uh, and this continues with the idea of uh, how we teach BIM. So if we, uh, I'll take an example here for, uh, if, um, just to explain the idea of how BIM could be used as, uh, as an educational tool in itself. So if you take, for example, uh, a typical, for example, let's say Tekla structures. And the Tekla structure uh, columns uh, that you would have in Tekla structures, which are the object libraries. You pick any column over there, it follows the local standards, it has all the details that a typical column would have. Now if you compare it to what you find in a book, so if you think of a book as a reference material, you, you explain how to design a column and then you support it with figures, right? You, and then students go through diagrams and see how a column is designed. You see what are the elements of the column designed in there. All that is already there in a BIM tool as well. But do we use it that way? We do not. So we separately teach how to design columns and then you ask them to go and pick those column elements from a BIM tool to use within the design context. But if we were smart enough, we would be using these knowledge base that's already embedded in the BIM tool for education purpose as well. So that could itself be the reference material. So we could, while we are teaching in the class, ask, them, ask the students to go to a, pick a column in a BIM tool and then understand how it is designed. 
And then of course, as the discussion goes, what he does is it not only helps them understand the theory better, but it also helps them to link how the theory is really put in practice in the BIM tool as well. And that's a huge gap where we have a lot of opportunity in terms of developing learning technologies and so on. But I'll come back to, come, come to that later as well. But the other important part, as I said, uh, uh, and this is where we have been very strong, even though we, uh, the BIM education plan wasn't very concrete so far, is, uh, the, uh, del del uh, is the delivery of the bachelor's thesis, master's thesis, and doctoral thesis. This is actually where a lot of development in Finland in BIM has happened. Because even though we do not have any uh, direct or focused BIM education so far, I mean, it was there in bits and pieces. We were still able to move forward because of these uh, things, and these things moved very well because the industry supported it. So this is, this is something which at the university level remains the crux. And this, of course, then can be supported with uh, what the uh, applied sciences do. And then, of course, uh, together with uh, BIM workshops, which are particularly important for the continuing professional development and so on. And the other thing we realized uh, uh, of late is uh, you can't cover everything uh, within the curriculum. That's just, uh, uh, that's just not possible because you have the core uh, domain knowledge to be given as well. So one of the ways to tackle that is that universities or even for us, what we are trying to do is have these breakfast meetings where, where we talk about specific issues on BIM on a regular basis. These are informal events where you can get people to sit together and discuss issues and kind of resolve. That's one of the better ways to educate people because it's more socially and more uh, community-based learning. So uh, I'll, I'll go a little more uh, philosophical now a bit, but just to explain how we are approaching it. But what we to, and this is kind of uh, covered by what Michael was also saying briefly, is uh, what we really need in our students, or what do we really expect them to, because we are not preparing them for immediate future. I mean, especially in universities. Of course, we are preparing them for immediate future, so that in the five years' time, they should be able to go and make meaningful contributions to the companies and organizations they join. But, but these are the guys, guys who, are, who the university guys will go on to become the leaders of those companies. And these guys will lead where the industry goes. And that is what we need to aim for. We need to give them skills which allow them to go to work immediately, but also which allows, which prepares them with the foundation to, be, to continue learning from where they are. And this is, in, from that perspective, these are the kind of skills that we are aiming for. I mean, how do we use BIM within this context and still be able to give them both? And that's a, that's a difficult challenge. So we want them, and the other thing which is important, and this is also, if we just, uh, uh, probably it's the same applies here uh, uh, in the university as well. So if you go back to the statistics of how many of your students go and specifically, uh, for example, if you take a structural engineering course, how many students really out of 40 go on to be structural engineers in the long term? Maybe 5%, 10%. There are different career paths that students choose over a period of time as they go ahead. So what you're doing is you're creating, giving, giving them a solid base on which they can go on and build the direction of career whichever they want. And that is exactly what we understand here is we have, they have different career paths. How do you prepare them with a strong enough foundation to go along those different paths? So this is, this, that, that's the challenge. So we are, as we have discussed, uh, BIM is fairly complex in terms of uh, the kind of skills that you need or the kind of uh, uh, efforts that are required. So you have these dependencies between products, you have processes, I won't go into details, but you could think of products as buildings itself or the whatever you're going to design. The BIM tools themselves are products. Then you have uh, services could be thought of as products. And then, of course, you need processes which are technical, operational, commercial, contractual. You have uh, other skills which are equally important in BIM, if not uh, more than the technical skills, things like communication and organization, data management, and so on. And can you develop and can you deliver all this in a classroom setting? I mean, the traditional classroom that we have, used to have. You really can't. So we have to rethink how to really organize our classrooms. And also about what level of skills do we aim for in each of these aspects. And part of that is to, uh, going back to the point, is that we are, cannot expect to uh, have students spend time on one particular proprietary tool and they learn, learn the BIM skills. What they have learned, if, if they do that, is only learn this modeling skills with a particular proprietary tool. But even though that is important, the important point there is uh, that how do we convey the concepts uh, to them and how, how do we prepare them to plan ahead. 
Now this is uh, a little more uh, uh, philosophical here, but again, uh, one of the things which is uh, important to understand is that uh, a BIM user these days is not just a BIM user, they're also the tool builder now. So a designer who's using a BIM tool is also building the tool at the same time. And I'll give an example of that. So let's say you have these object libraries which are part of the tool. The thing that you need to design now, it's not there in the object library. So you have created a new object which goes into the BIM tool. So it becomes part of the library. So as, if, as individual designers keep on building these object libraries or their own individual customized objects, you're adding to the object library. And as you add, you're building the tool in the process itself. This is one simple example. This is more of just as an object library. But then you think of uh, skills where you need to customize uh, your BIM tools. You need to probably write some kind of apps to, or some kind of APIs to kind of connect new things. And this is the kind of skill which is particularly important in the, in the organizations which are doing development. <coughs> we are already struggling in Finland itself in terms of people with this kind of skills. How do you get students who are willing to know the basics of computing enough so that they can make those tweets? So that, that's, that's an area where there are some gaps to be understood. And of course, uh, and, okay, sorry. So what I was trying to say here, so I'll, I'll probably, at this point of time, I'll take a vote here. How many of you use Microsoft Excel? Can we, can we have a raise of hands? That, that's a fairly, I would say, about 80% or 60% at least said that, right? How many of you are, um, say, auditors or financiers or people who really need to be extremely good at uh, spreadsheets? I didn't see a single raised hand, right? The point being that uh, nowadays, if you think of doing any kind of uh, spreadsheet calculation or any of this tabulation or any kind of accounting, you can't imagine people not knowing Microsoft Excel or any of these spreadsheets, right? It, be it has become the basic norm. So if you think of uh, somebody as an accountant, can an accountant find a job without knowing the basic spreadsheet or any of those skills? You can't. Right. So uh, that's exactly the point. So there are certain tools which augment your capability. If you don't, you're limiting yourself. And this is exactly the point I was trying to convey. So if you use the BIM tools right, if you, if you think of an iron mask, if you use the iron mask right, you can become the iron man. If you don't, you become caged in the iron mask. This is just a metaphor, but that's exactly the problem. So if you do not use the right tools with the right ways, you are caught up in your own limitations. And that's going to be an even bigger problem in the future. And that needs to be tackled better. Right, so uh, the teaching scenario that we have envisioned for uh, BIM is following. Uh, rather than teaching BIM uh, in itself as a separate module, we have BIM projects. And what we do is we teach all of those courses that are taught typically in construction or even in civil engineering are taught using those projects. Because now you take the same examples and ask students to refer back to the same point. When they start doing that, they're able to see what are the connections and the dots between the different elements. And then they start looking at where the gaps between the different elements are. And that's probably a much better way to teach than going into teaching separately BIM and then teaching construction separately. I'll, I'll, for the want of time, I'll probably move a bit faster. So in order to do that as well, the other things which we want to do is we, we are very close, into, uh, we already have fairly close interaction with the industry in teaching. But we want to make it even closer. The other thing which uh, the industry wants is not just, because if you get industry involved then they spend time in it, they would like to get a bit more out of it as well. Of course they get good students, students with good skills. But the other important part is we can use these big projects that we do with students, where the students do it collectively together, to simulate what happens in the industry. That allows students to learn better what, what is the actual practice, but it also allows us to now do new kind of research uh, with reorganization of projects. So if you think of a new idea of how if you reorganize project management and that could improve performance, rather than doing it in the actual project, now you can do it with student projects. And once you have kind of found some good understanding of what might work, then you can actually take to pilot projects in the industry as well. So, so basically what I'm saying is you have to have find your own strategies of what works for you. So these are some of the approaches we are adopting. Uh, integration, as I said, uh, different aspects of civil engineering, uh, integration of practitioners into education, integration of research and teaching, so you can't separate teaching from research, uh, that has to be very well integrated. Uh, as I said, we are focusing on group work and project based things because uh, you can't uh, 
the problem with the current teaching is it ends up with students who work with non BIM, but when they start working in group work, they start realizing that BIM has BIM can only succeed when you start working together. And that you can't expect them to start doing after graduation. So they have to have that experience beforehand. Uh, this, the third is the case-based learning, as I said. So you need to have cases. And cases where you can see that those links work. At the moment, we do not have enough cases, and not enough cases are spread across. So we need to start collecting these cases and have some kind of a uh, set that we can move around. Flip classroom um, needs a bit of explanation here. Flip classroom is the idea where you don't teach everything in the classroom, and you don't, and the teacher is not necessarily deciding what to teach. In the flip classroom idea, what you do is you allow students to go around. And Google, I mean, these days YouTube and other places are one of the best sources to learn how to model and do things in BIM applications. And there are lots of uh, BIM tutorials about from different places. So one of the best ways to do is give assignments to students where they go and they learn things by themselves. So somebody might want to just learn, say, for example, one particular proprietary tool. Other students might be interested in some other proprietary tool. And that's their assignment. They have to do that. So they have developed their own skills. But then they bring it back, and then they discuss it with the rest of the group. That kind of exchange is possible. That, that is within, within the limited time frame that we have in classrooms. But if, uh, if we plan it the other way around, it doesn't work, because we do not have enough time and resources for that. And finally, as I said, I mean, we need to develop better learning solutions, uh, which kind of uh, where you can use BIM tools as reference material. So you can use them almost like textbooks to explain how construction works, rather than the other way around. Just to give an insight of some of the things that we have been doing recently, so uh, one of the assignments I gave uh, very recently in a project was to ask them to go and complete Tecla online campus. So uh, we didn't have to teach them how to use Tecla. Tecla has this. And many other tools also, also have it. Many other uh, rather proprietary tools have their own uh, tutorials. They went on, learned the tools by themselves, then write, wrote a report about it. And then these reports were quite interesting to see how they reflected on what they've learned. And this was a much better way to manage time in classrooms. Uh, following that, what we are doing now is we are organizing the class design competition. The idea being that you have to change uh, the mode of uh, engagement of students. You have to kind of make it more student-centric rather than uh, and then, of course, we are teaching tools like Vico, which go into more of construction management, construction processes. So then they start learning new theories like location-based management system through these tools as well. Otherwise, uh, it's total disconnect. Um, just a brief idea of how we kind of organize our groups. A uh, couple of minutes. Uh, so this is just to uh, explain how we split the groups, so which kind of reflects on how we practice. and then. We use case studies as well as group studies to kind of deal with it. So uh, in conclusion, very important to understand whom are we teaching, what skills and knowledge we are giving, and uh, who, who is teaching as well. And that's equally important. We do not have enough skilled people to teach these people. And that's a huge problem. And uh, when we, uh, so I thought one of the other things, I kind of agree with the certification problem. Um, I, we do not have any certification thing at the moment in Finland as well, and we do have a similar debate of whether it's a valid point. But let's assume that we do want to certify. So, I have, uh, so the challenge is how do we meet the demand and how do we sustain that? So here are some very quick, uh, and I, uh, for the want of time, I'll very quickly go through this. Uh, what we need to do is we need to have a way of recognizing the skills that they have already learned. Because a lot of people just go and learn by themselves. How do we certify them for those? But the certification, but the problem is, what do you certify for and for how long? Because BIM tools are changing rapidly. And so if somebody is certified to be, say, an expert today, might not be an expert in three years. So how do you do that? And uh, so rather, I would say, leave certification to proprietary tools to certify people who work with their proprietary tools. For example, you have Microsoft certified program. So maybe they just take Tecla, Tecla, Tecla certified, Tecla model, right? So we could leave it to something like that. And uh, we need to decentralize it. I mean, universities and applied sciences, they have limited numbers. Some numbers, I think, uh, put uh, the demand in UK at the moment to around 3 million people are needed. Can universities and applied sciences meet that demand? You can't. So you have to find a way to decentralize it. You skill, you train some people, certify them to train some other people. So that's the kind of chain we need to build. And of course, self-learning and learning technology will help there. I'll skip this slide just for the want of time. But the idea is that things are changing not just at the product level, technologies change, policies change, environment, and they are mutually dependent. So you need to understand this to have a plan. Right, sorry, sorry for rushing.